Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jeffrey. In this video, we're going to talk about cancer. Sorry for not making a video for the maybe past week or so. Um, I've been extremely busy. But let's just first talk about cancer. And there's going to be two major uh, uh, categories that cancer falls under. And it's going to be monoclonicity or polyclonicity. And essentially, monoclonicity just means that um, the there's only uh, one certain type of mutation that is found in all of the cancer cells. And then polyclonicity is where uh, you take a look at the cancer cell and they actually have multiple different genes that are affected, which is not usually the case. Um, so uh, because it's, it's a lot more rare for polyclonicity to appear if it's not, for example, uh, a familial type of cancer that you inherit from your parents. So for monoclonicity, there's going to be three different types. There's going to be X inactivation, where all of your cancer cells have the exact same X inactivated copy. Now remember, um, this is only going to happen in females because once again, um, you only have X inactivation in females or uh, patients with Klinefelter syndrome, for example. And um, but you know, Klinefelter's is already a tough enough um, disease on its own, but Essentially, you're just not going to have that random X inactivation. So if you can see that every single uh, uh, X copy on this cancer in these cancer cells are um, are mutated in the exact same way, then you can see that uh, this is going to be X inactivation. You could also have cancer chromosomal abnormalities. So this is where uh, all cells have the exact same genetic aberration. So for example, if you're going to look at chromosome 18 um, uh, and, you, and you can see that that's, there's going to be a certain mutation on that MYC gene um, and it's the exact same mutation, then that's going to be a cancer chromosomal abnormality. And then the last one is uh, antibodies, right? So for multiple myeloma, for example, you're going to have the exact same type of antibody that is produced by these cancer cells to attack B cells. So that's, uh, these are the three major ways that you can test and see for monoclonicity. And then if it's not that, and, if you, and you can see maybe all three of these, then maybe it's polyclonicity. There's going to be some uh, major genes that are targeted by cancer because once again, remember cancer likes to divide uncontrollably and in order to get that division, um, that uncontrollable division, you're going to need maybe one or maybe all four of these uh, different factors. So either you can have a gain of function in your proto-oncogene, so this is going to be uh, what is known as the one hit type of hypothesis where if you just have one proto-oncogene that is upregulated as opposed to two, both of them, then you can actually get cancer because um, these proto-oncogenes actually stimulate that cell division cycle, right? And it allows you to bypass that G1, uh, S, G2 phases, all right? Checkpoints. Uh, you can also have your tumor suppressor. So uh, remember that the most famous is going to be P53. But essentially, this is going to be a loss of function. Um, it's what we refer to as a two-hit hypothesis because you need both of those P53 genes or both of those tumor suppressor genes to uh, be mutated in order to get um, uh, a cancer, right? So you only need one functional copy in order to actually uh, maintain the function of this tumor suppressor. But essentially, remember, it's going to be a loss of function. There's going to be apoptosis regulating, so this can be either gain or loss of function. Uh, as you might imagine, for loss of function, this is probably going to be happening in your cancer cells, right? So if your cancer cells have a loss of function of apoptosis, that means they're going to survive longer without dying. And then a gain of function will be in those somatic cells, in those regular cells that are not cancerous. And then finally, it's going to be DNA repair. And as you might imagine, uh, we have many, many different mutations or um, uh, carcinogens that are going to try to uh, make sure our base pairs are not going to uh, uh, pair correctly. Um, and these are going to be loss of function in order to cause cancer. This is just a short 
uh, kind of figure, small figure, showing you the MAP kinase pathway. Essentially, you're going to have a growth factor. It's going to bind to that growth factor receptor, and it's going to activate RAS, which means switching out that GDP with a GTP, and that RAS actually has intrinsic GTPase activity, so uh, it'll be inactive again. It'll inactivate itself by subbing out that GTP with GDP over a very short period of time, but not before it activates this active RAS pathway where it interacts with many different downstream effectors leading to activation of gene transcription and then also other different types of um, changes throughout the cell. Now everything that I've labeled in salmon here are going to be certain mutations that are going to allow for uh, maybe cancer to progress. So uh, the these two different things, the CERBB and your NEU, are going to lead to a constitutively active growth factor receptor. And you might imagine that that is going to definitely increase the amount of RAS and the amount of downstream effectors leading to uh, maybe cancer because of uncontrolled cell growth. For your RAS, uh, that's going to be your binding protein itself. Maybe this will be always inactive or, or always active. Uh, uh, it'll... Um, uh, it'll have some mutation in it that allows it to be more active than normal, maybe even uh, without a growth factor uh, binding to that growth factor receptor. And that's going to lead to um, uncontrolled cell growth. You can also have ABLE, which is going to be a GTP uh, binding protein. So it's actually going to just continually bind to that RAS and le uh, making it active. Because once again, remember that GTP, right? And then you can have certain um, genes that are going to be uh, uh, mutated. So for example, your CMYK or your CFOS, CJUN, and those are going to lead to uncontrolled cell growth as well. So remember, RAS is going to be a proto-oncogene because it leads to cell growth, and a mutation in maybe uh, in 12 or 61 is actually going to lead to that constitutive uh, GTPase activity, uh, that GTP activity. So unable to have that GTPase activity, okay? Um, there's going to be certain, um, uh, certain oncogenes and certain uh, pathways. Um, so we're going to go over breast cancer first. So breast carcinoma is basically your normal pathway is going to have a growth factor uh, binding to that receptor tyrosine kinase that leads to a dimerization. So if we look back here, your growth factor binds to the receptor tyrosine kinase. It leads to a dimerization and allows for those downstream effects, right? Allows for that autophosphorylation of that RAS pathway. So here, um, the actual receptor tyrosine kinase is actually going to be HER2. And uh, in breast cancer, essentially we're going to have upregulated HER2. There's going to be a ton of receptors. Uh, and as a result, any uh, amount of the actual uh, growth factor binding to HER2 is going to be amplified, right? Um, and that, and you can also have constitutively active uh, dimerization of that receptor tyrosine kinase. Well, um, so it can either uh, have that overexpressed HER2 uh, or and or be constitutively active. And as a result, you might imagine it's going to lead to that increased autophosphorylation and increased uh, oncogenic activity. Now, there's going to be two different ways that you can overexpress your HER2. You can either have amplification from a double minute. A double minute is an extra chromosomal piece of DNA that somehow find, found its way into the nucleus and was being transcribed. Or it can be a homogeneously uh, staining region. So these regions are actually just going to be uh, duplications of the HER2 gene. So when it actually does get expressed, you're going to make two, three, four copies as opposed to just one, right? So you're going to have that overexpression of HER2. You can also, this is the gene that actually encodes for HER2. So maybe uh, if the ERBB2 gene is going to be um, mutated so that it's uh, transcribed constitutively or transcribed more than normal, you can also have that overexpression of HER2. Now the treatment is going to be Herceptin or um, uh, tra Trastuzumab, and that's going to actually um, be a monoclonal antibody for HER2. Um, all right. So, 
Um, so we talked about ERBB2 is going to be for HER2 for breast cancer. Um, for your chronic myelogenous leukemia, this is actually going to be for uh, ERBB1, okay? But essentially, this is just going to be um, uh, malignant white blood cells, right? Um, so you're going to have a translocation of ABL, which is an oncogene from chromosome 9 to chromosome uh, 22. So uh, that's going to encode for your BCR, okay? And that's... Uh, uh, this is also known as the Philadelphia chromosome because your chromosome 22 now actually has a fusion of your ABL with your BCR gene, okay? So that's going to make a fusion gene and um, it's going to make a, a protein that's going to be coupled together and it's going to result in a constitutively active tyrosine kinase. And this tyrosine kinase is going to be um, in your cytoplasm. All right, so the treatment for this is going to be imatinib or Gleevec, and that's going to bind to the ATP binding site of the BCL ABL complex. So when you have your BCL ABL, it's going to look something like this, and it's going to have that ATP binding site right there. And remember, your cell actually has a, a ton of ATP, so anytime that ATP is bound there, it's going to be the active a BCL ABL complex, and it's going to lead to a constitutively active uh, tyrosine kinase, right? So uh, imatinib is essentially just going to be binding to that ATP binding site, um, uh, preventing uh, this BCL able from doing its oncogenic activity, all right? You can also have Burkitt's lymphoma. This is going to be a translation of your MYC, which is on your chromosome 18, to your chromosome 14. So remember, this is going to be a major difference here. Philadelphia is 9 to 22. MYC is going to be 18 to 14. And this is going to increase your expression of, um, uh, of MYC with your IGH, which is an uh, activation promoter, okay? Active promoter. Um, and that's going to lead to um, uh, this oncogenic transition, all right? Okay, so now that we went through these different oncogenes that are going to be uh, under this type of pathway, um, let's actually talk about the tumor suppressor genes, okay? So um, before we talk about overexpression of oncogenes, now we're going to talk about maybe underexpression of your tumor suppressors. Remember, we talked about the two-hit hypothesis before. Um, essentially, you're going to need um, two hits um, in your uh, tumor suppressors in order to have cancer, right? Because you only need one copy uh, to make a good if you will, P53. So for your sporadic, you're going to have two random mutations, and this is going to happen in the exact same gene uh, in the exact same cell, because once again, remember, in your sporadic cancers, it's actually going to be all of your cells are, are normal, and then you're going to need uh, essentially two mutations on the exact same gene to knock out that tumor suppressor. For familial, you're going to actually have a mutation in all of your cells because this is going to be from meiosis and it's going to be from um, your parents, right? So it's going to you're going to have one hit uh, already in every single one of your cells. So once again, this second mutation is going to be uh, a lot easier to get or receive than from your sporadic cancers because every single gene. Uh, is mutated on one of them, right? And you need two mutations. So familial cancers usually result in multiple tumors and uh, is very early onset. Now there's going to be many different mechanisms for your second hit. You can have non-disjunction uh, during mitosis or meiosis. Uh, you can have mitotic recombination, which is uh, where you have just one cell that actually results in um, uh, in that second hit to your p53 uh, you can have gene deletions point mutations uh, or even methylation okay so for your tumor suppressor genes it's going to be your retinoblastoma your p53 your apc yeah um, and um, you can also have this msh2 mlh1 pms uh, pms1 or 2 
BRCA1 or 2, remember that's for breast cancer, neurofibromatosis, um, and WT1. Okay, so uh, just diving into the different diseases, uh, Wilms is going to be loss of function of WT1, just remember W, Wilms, and that's going to lead to renal cancer, which is cancer of your kidneys. Renoblastoma um, is going to be your renoblastoma protein inactivation, and that's going to be on chromosome 13. Essentially, the normal pathway is going to be cyclin CDK, it's going to phosphorylate retinoblastoma, and that retinoblastoma is actually going to um, allow for E2F activation, leading you to go from your uh, bypass that G1 and go to the S phase, right? So if you have a mutation in RB, then uh, that E2F might be constitutively active. So if you have no cyclin CDK, for example, uh, see, we see here that your RB is always going to be bound to your E2F, and that's actually going to lead to uh, uh, G1 arrest, right? Uh, so if you have a loss or mutant uh, retinoblastoma, it doesn't bind to that ETF, E2F, so that E2F is going to uh, lead to it, uh, just continuous S uh, activation, right? Um, Okay, so for your Lee from many syndrome, uh, this is essentially going to be a p53 mutation. Just remember, uh, Lee from many is going to lead to many different cancers because it's going to be a p53 mutation. Remember, this is kind of like what we refer to as the gateway of the cell of the cell cycle. So, um, and this is always going to result from uh, a maternal inheritance pathway, uh, and it's uh, it's a terrible terrible disease. You can have familial aden adenomatous polypopsis, um, and this is basically just going to be colorectal cancer, okay? It's going to be an autosomal dominant disorder, um, but remember, just because it's autosomal dominant doesn't mean that you're going to always express that cancer, right? Autosomal dominant just means that you're definitely going to inherit that first mutation, uh, and remember, you need two hits in order to get cancer. So this just essentially means that you're guaranteed to have one hit in all of your cells, and then uh, all you need is just one more hit uh, to receive the cancer. All right. So this is going to be also WNT. So uh, you have your WNT signal leading to your beta catenin, and then leading to proliferation after TCF4, right? No WT signal is going to lead to APC that is actually going to um, bind to beta catenin and it's going to phosphorylate beta catenin leading to your ubiquination and degradation by a proteasome. So the disease here is actually going to be an APC mutation, right? So if we uh, look back to that APC, this is basically going to say that if you don't have a WT, WNT signal, APC is not going to degrade that beta catenin, and that beta catenin is just going to translocate into the nucleus and lead to that proliferation. So that's kind of like the normal pathway, if you will, but um, uh, it's just saying that your APC is going to be mutated, so it's not going to do its normal function, which is degrading that beta catenin, okay? You can have your hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer. So this is this is still colon cancer, but this is a, a different type of colon cancer. And this is essentially going to deal with your DNA mismatch repair, right? So uh, this is just going to be your MSH2 on your chromosome 2 and your MLH1 on your chromosome 3. And these mutated uh, genes are actually just going to lose uh, its functionality. And as a result, you don't have your DNA mismatch repair leading to uh, cancer, right? Breast cancer, BRCA1 and BRCA2 are going to be your tumor suppressors. And if you have them mutated, that's going to result in uh, the inability of your cells to undergo DNA repair uh, slash uh, make itself go through, undergo apoptosis when it realizes that it has many mutations, okay? So, um... Once again, uh, going over that G1 to S regulator, remember it's going to uh, require your cyclin CDKs as well as your RB. And your cyclin CDKs are going to phosphorylate the RB, remember, and that's in turn going to 
um, uh, allow it to uh, allow that cell cycle to continue to progress because of E2F activation. Okay, so um, essentially th these are just going to be your regulators for that G1 to S pathway. Um, and then once again, uh, if we look back, uh, uh, it's you're going to have that cyclin CDK, cyclin D, CDK4. It's going to uh, inhibit the RB, um, and it's going to uh, inhibit the E2F, right? So this is essentially going to be that P16 pathway because it inhibits the cyclin CDK, um, and then that's going to inhibit, obviously, the RB, which is going to inhibit your E2F, which is going to inhibit that uh, progression from G1 to S. You can also have your P53. This is going to lead to your G1 arrest, so um, this pathway is actually for uh, the transition from G1 to S. This one is actually going to stop it. And uh, P53 can also increase your DNA repair. Uh, and then if the damage is too great, it, it can induce apoptosis, right? So um, yeah, it can promote BACS and BACS is going to actually undergo that apoptosis pathway, allow you to go undergo that pathway. You can also have miRNAs. So miRNAs uh, can be either a gain of function or a loss of function once again. So if you have increased miRNAs, you can use it to silence certain uh, um, tumor suppressor or DNA repair genes. Uh, or you can have decreased miRNA. So uh, it, it, it'll uh, degrade less of the RAS and MYC. And these are going to be those oncogenes, remember, that we talked about before. All right. So this is going to be um, the end of the video. Uh, I hope that uh, you guys have learned something, and I hope that this video has been helpful. Thank you. Have a good day.